Hello everyone and welcome back to another physics video on quantum mechanics. I hope you had a very good weekend and I hope you are doing very well. Speaking of which, today I'd like to talk about that, about wells, or more specifically, potential wells. In the context of physics, these potential profiles are characterized by a region in space at a constant energy level, surrounded by another region with much, much uh, higher energy level. A two-dimensional version of this could very well be a water well. The water inside has significantly lower gravitational energy with respect to the ground. Now, today I would like to study a quantum version of this system, but in one dimension. So, to the same, let's start by the following Gedanken experiment. Imagine a ball inside two impenetrable walls separated by a distance L. The ball starts at x equal to zero and has some velocity in the positive direction. This ball then scatters back elastically when it reaches the other wall located at x equal to L without losing any energy or decreasing its velocity. Now we can say the ball behaves like a particle. Why? Well, because it's a deterministic system. In other words, if we know the position and velocity of the ball at a given time, we can obtain its position or arm velocity at any given time. And the only uncertainty that we could possibly have comes from the devices we use to measure, not from the system itself. Now, the energy of this system is continuous and it is determined by the mass and its momentum. In, princi in principle, there is no lower limits. In fact, if the ball didn't move at all, the energy of the system would be zero. And finally, if we pick up the system at a random time, the ball can be at any position with equal probability. This is just a consequence of the fact that the potential is constant inside the wall. Now, these properties are not only common sense, but also physically sound, at least in the world we all know and love, the microscopic world. However, if we want to study systems with much, much smaller length and energy scales, comparable to the size of an atom or a molecule, our ball requires a different treatment a ball requires quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, the position or momentum of the ball cannot be determined by a single value. Instead, the ball is going to be described by a probability cloud, which we can obtain from something that we are going to call wave function. From this wave function, we can obtain the average value um, for the position or momentum. And for this reason, these are normally called the expectation values. And how to calculate them as well as their time evolution is the topic of this video. So we are going to begin this journey with the static version of the wave functions or their starting point. Because alongside with their time evolution, these are the ingredients we need to compute and to track the time dependence of the expectation values. Okay, so let's begin. What is a wave function? Broadly speaking, a wave function is a function that can be expressed as a linear combination of complex exponentials of this type, with a wave-like dependence on space and time. In the context of quantum mechanics, there is an additional property. Its amplitude squared is a probability distribution, like a Gaussian or Lorentzian in statistics. And it has a very concrete physical meaning. It gives the probability density of finding our ball at its position. Now, this wave function plays the role of the ball, and therefore it also needs to obey an equation of energy balance. The kinetic energy plus the potential energy is the total energy. Now, notice that we can actually express the momentum and the energy in terms of derivatives with respect to x and t, respectively. When we do so, we obtain the Schrodinger equation. This is the type of differential equation that is separable. The solution of this equation can be expressed as a product of two functions, a function of x and a function of time. If we introduce this product of function in the equation of O and solve the part that depends only on time, we find a time dependent function of the wave function that follows this complex exponential. And by the way, this is always true so long as the potential that we introduce here only depends on x. The proof 
is trivial. So I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you to try. And we are going to focus on the time-dependent, time-independent part of the wave function, because the function that depends only on the position is actually the real deal. And it obeys the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Now, let's write down explicitly what a one-dimensional well means in mathematical terms. It's a function that is infinite everywhere except for a real region between zero and L, where it, is, it has a, a finite value, let's say zero. Now, obviously, the wave function must vanish at those regions where the potential explodes, because otherwise the function above would not work. Therefore, we're just left with a differential equation valid only from zero to L, that must be solved. And this differential equation is somewhat easy. So we are hunting a function that when we derive twice, we get a negative real constant multiplied with that, by that function. Of course, this function must be either a sine or a cosine. Then we are not still we are still not out of the woods because we have three unknowns on the table. C1, C2, and K. To determine their values, we need three constraints. Two of them are found using the continuity conditions at the boundaries of the well. We said that the wave function must be zero at regions one and three. And that includes x equal to zero and x equal to L. So the continuity at zero rules out a possibility of having cosines on the menu because cosine of zero is one. On the other hand, con continuity at L sets an infinite set of discrete values for L, which in turn prescribes an infinite set of discrete values for the energy. So the last unknown is C1. It's a proportionality constant. And the third constraint that fixes that value comes from the fact that the square of the wave function represents the probability density. And the area beneath this curve needs to be one. So this determines the value of C1 and putting all pieces together, we have wave functions at t equals zero. I want to present the first three of them. Okay. By the way, do these wave functions look familiar? Because indeed, you have seen them before. These are the first three oscillating modes of a string. Now, we are going to add the time evolution. I'm going to start this section by noticing that I said something that is not entirely correct. The prefactor that you see here in front of psi is not the only possible normalization factor. It could also have been negative. And in fact, it could also have been any complex number with modulus squared equal to two divided by L. This actually doesn't matter because remember, the phase of wave functions do not carry any physical meaning, only in its amplitude squared. And for these reasons, I'm going to plot here the black in black lines, the square of these amplitudes. Alongside, by the way, with its imaginary part, because now I'm going to reintroduce the time dependence. Let the time run. Now, this is interesting. Look, the amplitude squared of the wave vectors of the time independent Schrodinger equation actually do not depend on time. At this point, I'd like to compare the system that we have with classical analog. This system is purely probabilistic. We cannot really determine exactly the position at any single time. Instead, we have a probability distribution that tells us how likely the ball is to be at a given position. Notice that for wave functions that obey the time independent training equation, this probability distribution remains constant over time, pretty much by construction. Energy is discrete and proportional to n squared. Notice that, unlike the previous case, there is a minimum value for the energy, which corresponds to n equal to 1. This is a so-called zero-point energy. Now, finally, even though the potential is equal at any single point, every single point within the well, if we pick up the system at random time, the ball can be at any position, but not with equal probability it is more probable to find the ball around maxima. This would be the center of a wall in the, in the simplest case, these two points in, in, the, in the first excited states and these three points in the following set of states, et cetera. 
As you see, quantum mechanics shows a completely different world that looks nothing like the microscopic world that we know. However, this is actually not the end of the story because a linear combination of wave functions is also a solution of a time-dependent Schrodinger equation. This is something worth checking, so I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you. And instead of proving that, I'm going to propose an example. I'm going to take the first two eigenvectors. I'm going to attach each of them one factor. I'm going to add them up. And I'm going to study the wave function that comes out of it. Now, pay attention because this part is crucial. When working with wave-like entities, probabilities do not just add up. We add wave functions first. We sum the real and imaginary parts of the wave functions separately. And only then we compute the square. Computing these products, we get cross contributions that in general do not cancel. And in fact, they're really important because they to the essence of quantum mechanics, interference. And it is precisely this interference what makes it possible now that probability density evolves with time. Notice that in these animations, we can draw some parallelism already with the classical version of this problem. After all, it looks like an oscillating probability cloud moving from one side to another. So in order to put some numbers into that oscillation, let's construct explicitly the functional form of this probability cloud and evaluate the amplitude squared of a wave function. That is, the amplitude squared multiplied by its complex conjugates. Now the direct product sine, sine px divided by l sine px divided by l, so the first with the first and second with second, is going to produce a time independent contribution. And this makes perfect sense because e to the plus something multiplied by e to the, to, to the minus that something is just one. However, the cross product term survives and it actually produces a contribution that oscillates with a period equal to the energy difference of the two eigenfunctions divided by HR. So this is really important because it's a property that is going to be inherited by all expectation values. And as an example, I'm going to compute two of them, the first one being the momentum. Sorry, the position. So the position, the expectation value of the position is going to be given by a function X weighted by a probability distribution. This calculation requires the valuation of two integrals that you see here. The, um, the two type of integrals. The first, uh, the first two type of integrals is just a sine squared multiplied by x. It's not the easiest thing to solve in the world, but you can actually do it if you express these signs into complex exponentials. I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you to try. This should be given uh, by one fourth each. And then the remaining two, um, in the remaining integral that you see here in square bracket, it's also can be also um, computed by expressing the signs as a product as um, sum of complex exponentials, and it's going to give something a bit more tricky, minus one sixteen minus sixteenth divided by ninth pi squared. Again, I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you to try because it's it's good to have some. Uh, to, to, to enforce, reinforce your mathematical muscle. Anyway, now it's time to bring back the position dependence with in the particle description of the problem. If you remember, it was a triangular function. If we compare these to the result we have just obtained, implementing the wave description, we see that it is indeed a function that oscillates around the center of the world but it does so in a less sharp way. In fact, it never reaches the boundaries of the, of the world. Now, I'm going to go on to compute the expectation value for the momentum, which is a little bit trickier because this object needs to be expressed in position representation, which involves a derivative of the wave functions with respect to x. To compute the expectation value of momentum, we proceed in the very same fashion. This time without the x, and performing the derivative over the wave functions first. So the direct products now do not contribute at all. These products we can um, and the and the and the cross product terms actually contribute. In fact, they quite a lot. 
We can integrate them again by expressing these signs, these trigonometrical functions in uh, using complex exponentials. And the result that you should obtain is something like 4L divided by 3 pi in each case. Again, I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you to try. And as previously, we could compare the um, sinus, these, these sinusoidal behavior with the particle description that you, we had before. In the classical approach, we had square function with sharp changes in the momentum every time the ball hits a wall. In this exercise, using this particular linear combination of wave functions, we expect that the momentum is not going to oscillate like that, but sinusoidally between its maximum and minimum value, reaching zero every time the ball hits, is, is, um, hits the wall. Okay, now to conclude this video, I'd like to go back to the first slide and run side by side the two animations and invite you to ponder about the differences and similarities. Of course, the animation on the right is by no means something general. If I had chosen a different linear combination of wave functions, we might have not obtained such a simple sinusoidal behavior for the expectation values. But I believe this is a good starting point for you to try new things. For example, you can prove that the product of the standard deviation of the position and momentum is always greater than h bar divided by two. This is the Heisenberg principle. I think this proof is trivial, so let me stop here and leave this as an exercise for you to try. In the meantime, thanks for having worked with me till the end of this video, and we will meet next, next week for more, with more physics. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>